thank you everyone for joining us for the Kaliba Horror, Mystery, and Suspense panel. Uh, I'm Mary Elizabeth Adraldi with Creating Conversations in Southern California, and I'm pleased to be uh, talking with our panelists today. Uh, and I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, and then I'll have some questions for them. And um, as Valentina said, there's a Q&A button. Um, you can also uh, comment in chat, um, but it's easiest for us to be sure that we see your questions if you put them in in the Q&A. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Nadine Matheson is a criminal defense attorney and winner of the City University Crime Writing Competition. She lives in London, and The Jigsaw Man is her first novel. Welcome, Nadine. Thank you very much for having me. I had to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and, uh, we, we appreciate you joining us, and, um, and uh, there will be questions about the action figures on your bookshelves as we continue. Oh, to, uh, I forgot that you can see everything. <laughs> All right, uh, next, uh, welcome Cassandra Rose Clark. Cassandra has been nominated for both the Pushcart Prize and the Philip K. Dick Award, and is frequently published in magazines like Fantasy and Science Fiction and Strange Horizons. Her 2012 novel, The Assassin's Curse, was a YALSA Best Book for Young Adults from the Library Association and a Kirkus Reviews Best Teen Book of the Year. She's a graduate of Clarion West, and her new book is Forget This Ever Happened. Welcome, Cassandra. Hello, thanks for having me. And uh, our next contributors are two who worked together, which is very exciting. So Emily M. Danforth is the author of the highly acclaimed young adult novel, The Miseducation of Cameron Post. She has an MFA in fiction from the University of Montana and a doctorate in English from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. She lives with her wife and two terrible dogs in Rhode Island, which is in the process of undergoing a name change, I believe. And Plain Bad Heroines is her first adult novel. And Plain Bad Heroines was created in partnership with Sarah Lautman, who is a cartoonist and illustrator. Her drawings have appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, Playboy, and the Paris Review, among other publications. She lives in Baltimore, where she teaches on faculty at MICA and feeds the cats. I assume those are your cats, not MICA's cats. Welcome, Emily and Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kaluba, for having us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Question, Rhode Island is undergoing a name change? No. Okay. Uh, isn't it taking off like the extended full? The, and Providence Plantations right. portion, which the state hasn't really used, but is still technically, I think, yeah, which I on think the monarch that's being removed like, finally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I think appropriate. And Andy Weinberger, fellow bookseller and author of An Old Man's Game and Reason to Kill. He is a longtime bookseller and the founder slash owner of Reader's Books in Sonoma, California, uh, my birthplace actually. Um, he was born in New York, grew up in Los Angeles area and studied poetry and Chinese history at the University of New Mexico which is all very West Coast stuff. Uh, and he lives in Sonoma where Reader's Books continues to thrive. And Andy, I hope that's still the case even in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, we're still, we're still rolling along here. We're, <laughs> we're uh, it's only been 29 years, so we must be doing something right, you know. Excellent. <laughs> all right, so speaking of the pandemic, um, the thing that y'all's books have in common is they could briefly be categorized as books where bad things happen to people. So living in the trash fire that is 2020, help give the booksellers on this uh, meeting 
a reason why readers want to read books where bad things are happening to people. Uh, Andy, do you want to go first? Uh, well, my my book is based in, in Los Angeles, where I grew up. Uh, my both both books, and uh, um, it's uh, it's sort of an homage to L.A. and uh, 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 not everybody likes LA, but I, I love it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, we moved back there for three or four years and, and um, I, I found myself, I talked myself out of a job basically at the bookstore by moving to be with my wife and, and her new career. And uh, so um, I was up on the ninth floor of a 12 story apartment building with no job and uh, nothing to do and the choice was either you know start writing again or jump out of the window you know so i started writing and uh and this is what came out and it, it's uh it's about it's about me and about my jewish upbringing and los angeles and uh and somehow it turned into a mystery <laughs> and this is the second one and now i've got i'm working on the almost done with the fifth one so i've created a monster here Wow, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And and would you define these as private eye mysteries or or just uh amateur sleuths? They kind of walk No, he's not no, he's not an amateur. He's uh <laughs> he's a private eye. He's a, a re semi-retired private eye who who, you know, every once in a while picks up a job. Uh but uh he and he's living with his wife who is suffering from dementia. So it's there's a there's a a, a love story in the background going on. And uh, and he has uh, a lot of he has a friend who's a, a Mexican American who who's his muscle man basically uh, he he has the the wisdom and the intuition and Omar Villasenor has the muscle and the uh, you know takes takes over when he needs some action uh, and uh, and he's friends with the cops and he's friends with lots of people but it's a it's also a big tour of L.A. so I go to a lot of restaurants I used to go to in L.A. and and uh, sample the food and uh, it's uh, it's um, it's very homey in that way you know so that might be something that it could offer readers during the time of pandemic is the offer opportunity to go to restaurants that either may not you be open could. for in restaurant <laughs> dining or not at right. all that's right all right, right. Uh, Nadine let's shift to you with our next sort of traditional uh, really creepy and disturbing, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, full on homicide detective special crimes unit mystery, yep. what the heck? See, I didn't think it was that creepy, but maybe that's because I specialize in criminal law, so I think it's fun. <laughs> but um, during the pandemic, you can transport yourself over to London, which is where I grew up in, where um, the Jigsaw Man is set. And obviously it starts when dismembered body parts are found on a riverbank. So it's, I call it like my love letter to South East London, but I don't think I'm showing you many nice parts of it. I'm showing you all the gruesome bits of it, but I think that's going to be fun for everyone, especially as they can't travel. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, so for example, uh, there was a passage early, fairly early on where, uh, where you're talking and about um, a, a victim and it's uh daniel kennedy 36 years old in a relationship lives in london <laughs> from london the profile photograph on his facebook page shows a smiling man standing on top of a quad bike with all his limbs intact and i just <laughs> felt like that was really encapsulated sort of the experience of the jigsaw man in many ways so yeah <laughs> creepy but Engaging. Creepy but yeah, creepy but engaging and I mean that's life. I think we especially now we're associating with each other so much over social media. And if you're meeting people up on Facebook, you'll see their little profiles, you know, and obviously when you meet Daniel Kennedy, he's in bits. Yes. <laughs> Lots of bits. Yes. And and you get to meet a lot of the characters with most of their bits and then maybe yeah. some bits mixed in which is it's, uh, yeah exactly and you definitely meet the the main protagonist and detective inspector angelica henley so she's got all her bits in, intact she's got a few um problems but yeah physically she's all there slightly damaged but there yes slightly damaged 
Thank you. All right, Sarah and Emily. Oops, sorry, just hit my own mute. Uh, we're, we're transitioning a little away from reality, but also there's some reality-based aspects to plain bad heroines. So can you talk about sort of the start of where that came from? Um, it, I mean, it's really, that there's a lot of layers in this because there's the actual person and then there's the fictional story layered on top of it and then there's the book of the fictional story on top of it and then there's the movie of the book of the fictional story and then there's illustrations some of which apparently came before the prose so what the heck please explain Sure. Um, I think uh, uh, the the book is a work we've been calling it metafictional sapphic gothic horror, um, and if that sounds like a mouthful, um, it probably does. Sort of our tagline or our math has been that it's picnic at Hanging Rock. If you're familiar with that sort of famous uh, boarding school novel, plus the Blair Witch Project. If you're famous with that horror movie times lesbians and then you get plain bad heroines and that also sort of uh, winks or alludes to the humor in the novel. Um, I think the easiest way to describe the book because it you know it does sound like kind of a lot when, when it's described that way especially that metafictional part is that it, it, it roughly is two equal storylines and one of those is set in Gilded Age at a Rhode Island boarding school for girls that is in the grips of a curse. Um, and that curse seems to be related to a very real memoir, which is called The Story of Mary McLean, which was uh, by a woman named Mary McLean, who was a, a, you know, a bisexual 19-year-old author from Butte, Montana. She was a sensation. Unfortunately, she's been somewhat lost to time, given what a big deal she was in 1902. Um, but something about this curse at this boarding school, and students are dying, seems to be related to that book. And then the present-day storyline of the novel really is about the making of a controversial queer horror movie about that curse. And so there's a lot of what I like to think of, and, and Sarah and I, um, I think, had fun with this. There's a lot of like a kind of fun house mirror effect where something will happen in the past and we'll get a different version of that in the present day. Um, or we'll get a scene or an image and we'll have a reflection of that or a distor distortion of that in the present day. So there's a lot of commentary between the two time periods and, and those are also reflected in, in Sarah's illustrations. I don't know, Sarah, if you have more to say about that, maybe. Um, well, there's so many, I mean, the idea of mediation is something that we talked about the, I don't know, it was just kind of a refrain that kept coming back. And we talked about so many things. I mean, I think we had our, our themes kind of nailed down. Mm -hmm. Like it was really easy and really fun for me to do research for the illustrations because they're from, there's like such a specific idiom, like in um, like illustration history and in publishing history and in queer history. So they like uh, these three things that you know, clearly we both discovered that we're nerds for, mm -hmm. um, just like kind of had this great confluence. And I was able to just like, you know, look at like tons of old boarding school books from the turn of the century, uh, tons of old um, like photographic references for how the costumes should look and how the uh, architecture should look. Um, and there there was one point where at this point, I'm, I, I know I'm in danger of going into Rambleville. So I'll, just say this one last part. There, there was a period of time where we talked about having the illustrations be um, full of hidden pictures, yeah. like um, yeah. hidden uh, yellow jackets, because yellow jackets are kind of the, like, a, a like they sort of are like the body of the um, this menacing spiritual presence, um, and. Well, now I don't want to say whether we did the hidden pictures or not, because I could, like, everybody could still kind of, like, be fooled into thinking that they're there and maybe they're just impossible to find. Uh, I don't know. We had a, this was like a very long engagement mm -hmm. and we had a lot to work with. And, and I was working with M, like, while she was, was composing, yeah, she was conceiving this book. So we'd go back and forth. And I mean, that's, I think that's pretty unusual mm -hmm. for, uh, this kind of like literary illustration, like usually like on like the business end, it happens differently and you'll get, as the illustrator, you would get the text once it was like mostly done. 
Um, so this was just kind of a cool and for me, like very unique uh, uh, project and work situation. Yeah, it was it was it was wonderful. I mean, it was so that you know what was alluded to this this idea that Sarah would do an illustration ahead of time. I think it was that I, I might not have a scene fully formed, or we would have discussed something that was going to happen in the book, and you would get started, or you would have. I think I think more often what might have happened is you would have a version of an illustration, and that might in the revision process change the way that I rendered something in the scene, right? Even if yeah. I already had some of the pieces in place, and that was really fun and not something at all. Um, I've never worked with an illustrator at all, and certainly not I didn't think the first time I did it would be on such a long novel and such an involved novel and I think if we hadn't been such nerds for the subject matter it just wouldn't have it wouldn't have been as fruitful so yeah yeah it was really um and you know we like found each other like into I wrote Emma fan letter after uh Cameron Post was out because I read it and liked it and we ended up corresponding a little bit yeah uh, and yeah. you know now it's like four years later or something that we've we've finish this big project yeah Sarah's much faster than I am <laughs> I mean and had a, like a way more work like you did you like wrote the book you know so that's those that are probably pretty time consuming that's awesome a uh, related question um there's a lot of footnotes in the book were they all created as you wrote or did you go back and fit them in or combination uh, i think most of them were in the initial sort of composing process very few were added um you know after certainly the, the draft of a chapter would be done um and really almost none i think after a whole draft of the novel was done but i tend to be a polisher so i i i, I you know I, I don't work only in a linear fashion but i do I do have a lot done usually before I skip ahead. Um, there were, there was, there, you can skip the footnotes, you know, you, as some people are wont to do, but you, um, there's plot in the footnotes. And so you'll miss part of the story if you do that. And there were a couple of times um, when, in terms of adding things to footnotes, when footnotes were fiddled with sort of in the drafting process or in the revision process to put some of those plot points in a footnote. Also, I just want to mention, I don't know if it, cracks anybody else up, but the fact that it was a buzz book for BEA, yeah. I was like, but of course it is because Yellow Jackets. So. Yes, because Yellow Jackets, and already early readers have been sending me copies of Yellow Jackets terrorizing them, which has really um, been fun. So and not something I expected people, it just seems like a thing now that people are noticing them and, and somehow blaming the book, which <laughs> I didn't anticipate, but I'll, um, I'm welcome. Send your Yellow Jacket stories. I'm happy to see them. And, and yet somehow creepily appropriate too. Sure, yeah, it does, it's fitting. <laughs> there you go. All right, and Cassandra, getting into yet another layer of reality, not reality, uh, <sighs> Texas, man, go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely Texas. Um, yeah, so Forget This Ever Happened is sort of a unique blend of like, it's like Philip K. Dickian science fiction, like time and space bending with a YA novel. Um, it has this really sweet um, sapphic romance, kind of like a first crush sort of thing that's happening at the same time that this small town in, in South Texas is dealing with monsters and a possible apocalypse situation and time and space not being you know, steady, steady, like they're very fluid and things are switching and changing um, and things are not what they seem. So it was really fun, really fun to write that kind of blend of genres and, and just kind of do different, you know, you know, have the like sweet little scene where the, the girls are flirting or they're going to the video store because it takes place in the 90s too, which is also, was also very, very fun. Um, you know, to have those little scenes and then mix them in with these weird, creepy, like outer space alien monster things um, and, and trying to exploring what's going on there. So that's actually a nice segue, which is talking about settings and time. So yours is 1993, which is an interesting choice to me, given your age, because it's not your own teen years, right? No, it's actually, that's about, it's about 
10 years um, ahead of my, I was a teen in the mid, the early 2000s, but I was a kid in the, in the early 90s looking up to teens. So it was, it was like, I was sort of like indulging in my, my little 10 year old, like, oh my God, look at all these cool high school students and their cool clothes and their cool music. Like I got to really kind of play around with that. Um, and they're so good at Ms. Pac-Man. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Emily and Sarah, uh, you have multiple time streams, one that's contemporary-ish, if you don't count the pandemic, and then of course the historical one. So you wanna talk a little bit about working in those timelines? Sure. Uh, the, yeah, the, the book originally, um, I didn't know that there was going to be a, a historical timeline. I thought I was going to write um, the story of the making of this controversial queer film that takes place at this abandoned boarding house and, uh, excuse me, boarding school in Rhode Island. And when I um, was answering for myself the question of why is this boarding school abandoned? What happened to it? I became more and more intoxicated with the writing the story of the past, not just finding out for myself, but actually putting that uh, material into scene. And um, I, I tried to do it. I'm not even sure if Sarah saw some of these versions. I tried to do it every other way imaginable. I tried to, you know, put it into journal entries or, you know, like there would be letters between characters and I just couldn't do it. It became pretty clear when I was dangerously far into a different draft of the novel that I wanted to write this historic story and it was important to me. Um, and so then that set off a lot of research, um, which is a, a dangerous thing for me. I know it is for a lot of writers because I'm happy to give myself over to it for a really long time uh, and sort of not come up for air. And this was uh, the kind of research that I love. I was reading Gilded Age ghost stories by Henry James and Edith Wharton and you know falling down rabbit holes that way. And I was, um, reading a lot about women's romantic friendships and women's relationships at boarding schools and colleges, obviously, people like Lillian Faderman, um, and also collecting sapphic stereo view cards off of eBay. So I, uh, you know, sort of the whole gamut. Um, and then I live in Rhode Island and Sarah has spent time in Rhode Island. And so many of the locations in the novel are fictionalized versions of real life uh, Long Island, excuse me, Rhode Island locations, including the Spite Tower. We have a Spite Tower in Little Compton. Uh, and we also have what's called the Windmill House. And that becomes the Manor House in, in my novel. So it's, there's lots of things taken from my life and the research that I did and, and sort of, um, you know, I'm like a bird building a nest that way. And I pick it up and I put it in. And Sarah, I don't, you know, I know that you did a lot of research for the illustrations as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, I mean, the only time period, I didn't draw any illustrations for the, um, uh, the present day or contemporary part of, of the book. All the uh, illustrations take place in the past, which is something we talked about and did on purpose because you know, we wanted it to feel like there was like an animus that happened in the past that only happened in, in the past segments. And even some of like uh, the choices that we made together about like how, how densely it should be illustrated or like where and how spot illustrations should show up. And of course, as things went further down the line and more people got involved, like some of those things, you know, were left to our like uh, uh, mood boards. But um, I feel like, I mean, all of the research that I did, aside from um, trying to get like the costuming right and trying to block everything and learning about, I don't know, I mean, the, the work that you do when, you, when you're uh, doing character design or, or set design sort of for illustrations is so much fun. Like it really is like a whole, as Em was saying, like research is, so much often so much more fun than writing that you can really get into it so just like i just looked at like tons of old stuff like tons of antiques that like would have been like old at that time that somebody would have had to have hold of like you know there's these parts in the book when like the girls have to um uh you know poke around the old house oh never mind there are some con uh contemporary illustrations my bad. But just like I had to think about every object that I, that I drew, not in the sense that I, I couldn't have fun and invent things, but um, I just wanted everybody's clothes to look right. And not even in the sense that, you know, the kind of hairstyle that uh, 
uh, a woman who was going to Wellesley in like, you know, the 1890s would have like her the hair in the correct shape. But I also wanted um, the present day characters to like be correct because mm. it drives me absolutely nuts. Like if you see a character who has like a certain, you know, we're inside of the story. There's a certain character profile here. I don't want to see them wearing some pants. That they would like totally never be wearing. Um, so I don't know. I was thinking about clothes and objects and, and buildings a lot. And I just kept a million tabs open at all times. And mm -hmm. it was really fun. Excellent. Nadine, did, did most of your stuff still feel uh, related to your work or did you do research and how does it feel to have a book that's contemporary but also people aren't going out and clubbing and gathering and all that because pandemic it with the book um when i've been going back over it um when i was doing the edits and things i was doing that right in the middle of the pandemic and the funniest thing was that some of my characters would be shaking hands with people or someone would actually use antibacterial wipes. And I'd be like, oh, well done. <laughs> You've used antibacterial wipes um, in this scene. So in terms of the pandemic, it's actually been nice to see people actually living, even though these are very strange lives that they're living. But it's nice to see people moving the way we, the way we used to. Um, but in terms of my work, I've, I have used like cases and bits of clients' personalities within, within, the, um, within the story of the Jigsaw Man. And I think obviously that probably hopefully led to a lot of authenticity in regards to the book. Well, obviously I'm a criminal defence attorney, so I can only look, view a, a case on one particular side, obviously defending the client. So luckily I've got a friend who's a police officer and she actually started out as a CSI officer. So I've used her a lot. I've called her with some random and ridiculous questions. So she's helped me a lot in terms of the police procedural um, side of things. But in terms of it being contemporary, it's, The Jigsaw Man is set in September 2019, so last year. And I'm working on book two, which is starts um, six months later. So it, technically it's right at the beginning of the pandemic. So, but I've decided I'm taking the DC Comics multiverse approach to it. So. This is not happening on this earth. It's happening on a different <laughs> earth, so I don't have to write about the pandemic. <laughs> it's Earth 52, right? Yeah, it's Earth, if that's what it is. That's where we are. That's where I thought. So I don't, uh, I don't think I could write very well about, you know, a dead body in a room. And I mean, I can't conduct an investigation over Zoom. So yeah, I'm in a different earth. <laughs> in order to like send people out, you know, picnicking and discovering. Yeah. Things like no nobody's doing that no one's doing that no one's the people walking their dogs but not that often so no i'm on a different earth <laughs> all right and andy back to you and uh and so so you're not currently in los angeles so so what do you do to make it feel like los angeles now ish yes a lot of people um uh, I noticed here are doing research. Uh, I do basically zero research. Uh, and I do a lot of, most of my work is from memory. And, uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't write with an outline or anything like that. I, I, I just start writing. And um, uh, it's, I, was, I was listening once to uh, E.L. Doctorow talk about how he writes and he says, said that writing is like driving a car down a, a mountain road on a foggy night and you can't see very far in front of you and you can drive see maybe 20 feet so you write that 20 feet and the next night you write the next 20 feet and eventually you get down the mountain uh so mine tends to meander like that and and as a result uh it's character driven i'm i'm they are these these are mysteries he's a detective these are mysteries and and i hang it the, the a mystery is what I, is the coat rack i hang it on but um mostly what i want to do is create a character that you care about and uh, and the characters uh, are all characters that uh i want you to be able to root for uh, I've, I've 
you know, in, in the 30 years I've been in the book business, I've read a lot of books and uh, I've, and some of them I get as ARCs, advanced reading copies. Uh, if I don't care about the character, I don't care how well it's written, how well it's plotted, any of that. If I don't like the character and I don't care what happens to him or her, I'll just throw it across the room, you know, <laughs> which I know is cruel, but, uh, but uh, that's what I want. And uh, so these are, uh, these tend to be uh, lovable, interesting characters. And, uh, and uh, I, I know enough about LA, even though I'm not there now. Uh, I can, I do some, you know, I look up, you know, like a restaurant, I'll look up, see what their menu is or something, you know, and put that on there. Um, sure they still have the oysters on the menu. Yeah, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and check out, check out the streets to make sure I'm not sending my, my character off in the wrong direction. But, um, but uh, I, LA is, LA is, is mostly in my head. And uh, I think it's mostly in the people who live in LA, it's in their head too, because you, you live inside your car and you, it's an internal, it's a cerebral experience. Um, so um, I have a friend uh, down in, uh, in Brentwood who says he's, he's selling the first book for people who can't visit these places. Here's what it looks like <laughs> if, you, if you ever, if, when the pandemic is over. Also, I'm not writing uh, he's Amos is an old man to begin with my character Amos Parisman and he keeps getting continually older uh, and I, I, I thought at one point I'd have to uh, you know start writing Amos Parisman the early years or something because he was getting so old that I'd, I'd be writing with with one foot in the grave you know but uh, but uh, I decided that it it really doesn't matter he just he'll just get incrementally older and uh and we'll just go on with it because that's that's the uh that's the uh point at which i i i like him the best he's he's most reminiscent of my father my grandfather my my you know my people and uh so i want to i want to keep replicating that if i do him too young i don't know who he is you know so um did that answer your question or what was, what was the question anyway <laughs> Uh, time and, and setting, but, but yeah. I, I think that you know, exploring yeah. the Amos and the characters is the is yeah. the primary. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, I completely eliminated the pandemic from my writing. I don't even think about it. It's he just has a normal life. I'm just going to pretend this never happened. Fair enough. Fair enough. All <laughs> right. I have one more question for you all, and then uh, I'll remind everybody else that you can also pop questions into either chat or the Q and A. So, and I'm actually going to start with Nadine for this one, which is about incorporating vocabulary or, or things that readers, that you want to make sure readers know what's going on, but you, you have characters who would know, whether that's, you know, criminal terminology, movie terminology, uh, you know, reminding people what a Walkman is. <laughs> Whatever, because uh, and and particularly starting with Nadine, because this, of course, is kind of discussed as CSI phenomena, right? Like, yeah, classically on the TV show, you know, the characters would say to each other, "Well, we will use this appliance, which does this," and you're like, "You're talking to someone who spent four years training in how to use it. They know how to use it, but the viewer doesn't." So, how do you how do you deal with terminology? And that's the, that's the thing that always concerns me the most because I'm always aware when authors info dump in a book and it really annoys me because I'm like, I don't, need a, I don't need a library lesson right now. I just need to, you know, give me the basic understanding. So, but obviously I realised that because of my career and my knowledge, I would insert terminologies and without even thinking about it because it's just second nature to me. So I've then had to go back and just find a way to insert it into maybe dialogue between the characters, maybe between a lay person and a professional. So then it comes across as being more natural because I said, there's loads of terms I would use and I said, I just want to think twice about it. And then actually I thought, actually, no, not many people are going to know what Holmes is, which is the internal police investigation and database. People won't know. If, when I refer to a crisp report, and um, for us, that's a criminal investigation report. 
But no one's going to know that. They're just going to, they'll be asking, who's Chris? I never met Chris. Like, is there a character called Chris? So I had to find a way to just insert that in terms of, in terms of dialogue without doing the whole info dumping, big blocks of paragraph explaining what um, a certain system is and, and things like that. So I was very aware of it when I was going through the rewrites, definitely. Well, I, I really, I found it all very accessible. I did have to occasionally like flip in my brain, right? Like, oh, and the US term for that would be buzz and such, but. Yeah, because there's a lot of things that, because of, you know, just the world we live in, that there's a lot of terminologies that we, we, we understand because, you know, people, we watch American TV or you watch British TV, so you don't question it. But then there are little things like even, calling myself an attorney we don't call ourselves attorneys in in England it's and we don't really call ourselves lawyers I'll call myself a solicitor but obviously in American translation I have to have to change it because they'll be asking what, what's a solicitor what what is people what is what is that are you soliciting are you, are you selling stuff but no so there are little things like that that you wouldn't think about and other things like like we call a pavement and you call it a sidewalk but if you called it the pavement you'd, you'd understand because you know you watch tv so you would know excellent uh cassandra do you want to go next and and remind us of the things that that you may have to explain to not necessarily people my age who lived through 1993 but to the the younger audience coming in yeah, I mean, it was definitely interesting because the book is a YA novel. So, you know, I'm expecting it's for teenagers and, you know, teenagers now, they don't know what a Walkman is. Like, I barely remember what a Walkman is, right? Okay, you <laughs> so, understand why your characters are not using their cell phones. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, there was, it was like really shockingly different, you know, just, just like, wow, what do they do all day? They, they don't have cell phones. They don't have internet. Um, there's no TikTok. Um, so yeah, a lot of it was, I almost, I almost kind of felt like I was over explaining a little bit. It was almost like how when I write uh, a science fiction or fantasy novel that's set in a completely different world, how you have to, you have to, you have to build that world up a little bit. You have to bring those details in. So I was really doing that with, um, with that set of sort of 90s setting. It was, it was very much that sort of like the past is us saying the past is another country, but it was almost like the past is another world, right? Um, I was sort of coming coming at it as a science fiction writer, you know, and just like really like describing the clothes, uh, making sure I was name dropping the the movies and the music that was really popular during that time, um, and really just kind of trying to create that um, that environment. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was definitely fun. And then then of course the the other thing is there's a lot of weird science fiction-y stuff that has to be explained too um, on top of that so it was it was really it was really a challenge but it was a fun one um, and I think I think it all kind of comes together um, you just kind of just kind of go with it and I was also I was really sort of especially with the 90s stuff sort of writing it to people who may be familiar with the 90s through like memes or pop culture stuff like modern pop culture stuff and really being like, okay, I'm not necessarily describing the 90s as they really were, but as how we remember them. Um, so that it would be, it would be more familiar to like TikTok teens who are using scrunchies on, you know, whatever, and, and, and kind of adapting certain aspects of 90s culture that have persisted. Sure, the way that like Happy Days was not actually a reflection of its yeah. era, but probably has informed the way, what way a lot of people think about that type of thing. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Emily and Sarah, what about you? Uh, the, you, what, you know, aspects did you have, like I'm thinking about Audrey and the fact that she comes out of the movie industry and so she's got all these shorthands and things and, and so what, what are things or, or things in the past that, uh, that you wanted to include without doing the info dump, as Nadine said. Yeah, I mean, I think there were a few things where the illustrations or even Sarah did a diagram of a stereoscope, which I love. It's one of my favorites in the footnotes. Um, and that was the thing that we had a conversation about, you know, like, I, I, I don't know that I would have explained the stereoscope. Um, I was on a panel earlier today and somebody said, we need to normalize that readers can Google things on their phone. And I completely agree with that. I just don't think it's that challenging. I trust my readers that if I haven't given you enough context, you're going to figure it out. But there are sometimes things, I mean, there's 
there's an entire sort of plot thread and several scenes built around these images the women are looking at on the stere their stereoscopes. I really wanted to make sure that readers knew what a stereoscope was, just in case, right? That they're like, oh, I have a vague idea that people were in the Victorian era were obsessed with them, but I'm not really. So that was a thing that we kind of labored on. Um, but I think my default is usually to what Cassandra was talking about, world building, to trust the world building I've done to convey information um, and to trust my readers that I've given you the context and that you can Google pretty easily on your phone if you're super confused. I just, you know, I, I do it all the time. I mean, I, I, almost every novel I read, I feel like I'm like, what is that, right? I want to know more about that. And, and it doesn't take away from the reading experience for me at all. I mean, I think it adds to it, so. So Sarah, what I want to know is in the stereoscope illustration, is it mm -hmm. spaced correctly? If I blow it up and put it in my stereoscope, <laughs> why? If you blow it up and put it inside of your stereoscope. Because the illustration is very small in the book, mm -hmm. but if I had it and it actually was at a size where I could have the two pictures in my stereoscope. Would... Um, well, I think you'd probably have to print it on uh, like some kind of transparency. Probably. Am I wrong? Um, you're the one who has all the stereoscope cards. Are they just cards? Uh, yeah, no, it's it's a complicated, I, I do not think that you could do that, but. Um, yeah, I, I didn't draw that really patent. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, like, found, I found patents. There's like uh, reflection and like, mirror like, involved. It's, there are, there are YouTube tutorials and videos that, you know, last minutes about how stereoscopes work. So I don't think our, our 2D image is going to yeah. quite cut it. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking about, um, uh, a Viewmaster, mm -hmm. which, I mean, Viewmaster is maybe more of an 80s thing. I was going to be like, maybe that's in Cassandra's book. It's the same idea, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, for, uh, dang it, it might be lost. Sorry. Um, oh, well. Oh, I had a, I think it's really great to um, have to look things up uh, and even to have to, like, release yourself from the text of something you're reading for a minute to, like, I mean, I, I feel like Googling is as effective in this sense as looking it up in a book or a dictionary was. Uh, and I, I had this professor in college who was like a huge pain in other ways, but he said this smart thing that I always think about. And, you know, I was like an English major, so we're reading like a, no like, uh, a Nabokov book, we're reading like Pale Fire. And not only is there a ton of footnotes in that book, but just the, the concepts that Nabokov talks about are so lookable like he really like sends you on scavenger hunts so my teacher in that class would always call it a footnote education and if there's something you don't understand you don't look it up you, you might remember it more because you went slightly further out of your way to find that information um and it makes it you know that's what's fun about reading and andy you actually provide a lovely uh, list. I believe you call it a few words you might be wondering about. Yeah, my, uh, my uh, publisher decided that it, there, there's enough Yiddish and Hebrew in this book that uh, you didn't want to alienate, you know, the rest of the population. Uh, so, I, so I went through the book page by page and pulled out as many uh, uh, phrases as I, as I could. Uh, a lot of them are, are incorporated into normal American parlance, but, uh, but, but there are things, you know, that, that add a lot of flavor to them, you know, like Alta Kachka, for example, is, is an old duck, you know, and sometimes I, I'll say Alta Kachka and then I put comma old duck and old, you know, or, or, or Momser is a bastard, you know, things like that. But, uh, uh, but it's, it's the way he talks and the way a few other people talk and that that lends uh lends a lot of flavor to it uh, i was in a in a writing group in pasadena and the one of the members uh was sort of offended by this in, initially because he was uh he felt excluded you know and uh so uh so that's that's what kind of led to this thing i said well you know philip roth doesn't have uh <laughs> A dictionary at the back of his book and uh, it worked but I'm not Philip Roth what do I know so um, anyway yeah so I, I do that and uh, that seems to be what what uh, adds some flavor to this you know well, I thought it was good because it 
incorporated all of the words. It didn't assume anything, right? So, like, I think most Americans know Tukuk, whether yeah. they have that background or not, but it was still included. So they right. got the sense of this is all vocabulary. We're not making any assumptions about what anyone right. knows. There's, there's a lot of Spanish in there, too, that because because he because of his his uh, his partner. Uh, so the Spanish and the, you know, occasionally other words, but uh, I didn't, wasn't going to have a complete international dictionary there at the end. So it's, it's a, it's a. Fairly it's a or not, I don't think you can have a contemporary Los Angeles work. No. It doesn't have Spanish probably, so. Yeah, well, LA, LA is a, is a huge international city. I mean, where we were living uh, was a, a heavily orthodox area. But if you walk six blocks down uh, Fairfax, you'd be in literally in little Ethiopia, you know, and, and two blocks the other way, you're in little Bangladesh. And uh, that's what I thought was wild about it, you know. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to do one last thing, which is uh, start prompted in part because of Nadine's office. So I'm going to start with her. Uh, tell us. One quick thing about something that we can see in your background, whether it's an action figure or a photograph or the things on Emily's wall, etc. So uh, let's okay. start with you. Only because you um, pointed it out, but like here's the Joker. Because I have a comic book obsession, and this entire shelf is filled with um, graphic novels. And if I was to show you the rest of my house, you'll see giant canvas prints. So yeah, I'm the person who goes to Comic Con. I don't do the whole dress up. But I will take my godchildren <laughs> with me as my excuse. But I will go to Comic Con and do all of that. So that's what's on my shelf. There are other books up there. James Elroy is up there because I love him. Um, he's on the top shelf. But yeah, what you can see is the comic book collection. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, Emily, tell us what's behind you, please. Uh, this is a, is, a, is a door from a, a truck, and it says Hall Brothers uh, Rocky Neck. Yacht and Vessel Corps uh, from Gloucester, Mass. Um, and there's a telephone number at the at the bottom. You can call if you need these these fine boats people to come and work on your yacht. Only they're missing a door, so they probably can't do this. So um, yeah, I was saying earlier that I uh, we have a lot of sort of found objects in our house, and this. Uh, we were buying something else from a guy on Craigslist, I think, uh, an antique dresser. And he was like, I have a bunch of spare doors in the back of my house, you know, from vehicles. And I was like, I definitely want to see those. Um, and then we went home with one. So, Looks like it would have been something of a, how do you display this project? Yeah, uh, the, the gorilla hooks are pretty amazing. I don't know if you know about those, but they leave tiny pinprick holes in your drywall. And, and there's three of them back there holding up a a you know, very heavy door, so knock on wood. That's impressive. Sarah? I have a lot of stuff. Um, I'm in my studio now, uh, and there's my glass table that I light box stuff on, and there are all my backpacks, um, and there is a big paper cutter over here. Uh, let's see, what can I, what is anything that's like a story object? So how does the paper cutter work with your work? Do you you make a piece and cut it down, or? Uh, well, when I uh, like sell or trade an original, I might cut it into uh, the size somebody needs to frame it. Or if I'm selling prints, usually I don't make like print my own prints here. But um, if I do, or if I do some kind of like like small edition screen print, which is very unusual, but sometimes happens. I'll use that to um, cut it in a straight line. It's just like a big old, like, you know, everybody had that at their elementary school and you have to be careful so you don't cut your fingers off. Yes, the cut your fingers off version versus the new sliding ones, which are not nearly as exciting. Yeah, no, this is the real deal. This is like from when um, uh, playground equipment could kill you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Cassandra, tell us about something we can see behind you, please. Right, so I'm just really in my bedroom and I have my dresser back there and I hang all my necklaces on the wall, like in little, I did these little frame things um, so that they could be art objects instead of just getting tangled in a dresser drawer. But I thought I'm going to tell my, my thing up a little bit. The coolest thing I have is that square 
thing that's hanging on the wall, that is actually, um, I cannot remember what it's called, but it's used to help you weave a loom. So um, you basically, it helps you wrap, you wrap the yarn around it like 16, 17 times, however many times, and then you are able to just lift it off. And so you have like a loop of, of yarn that you can then weave through a, through a loom without it all getting tangled. So um, I used to do a lot of weaving. And so I bought that to help me with it. And I haven't woven anything in forever, but I like to hang that up as sort of a weird decoration. It's very cool, and if you needed to, you could probably hang necklaces from it as well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, and Andy, tell us about your photos. Uh, well, my wife had a career for a while in L.A. as a uh, street photographer, and uh, so she took a bunch of, uh, she studied at CalArts, and she took a bunch of pictures. This, uh, this one is uh, my son's second birthday he's hitting a pinata in our backyard i don't know if you can see that uh and hey. this is our, our fam that's me gathered around and uh got, people are gathered around and uh my son is now 40 so wow. <laughs> it's been a while you know photo. <laughs> yeah but uh she had a great great career doing that so that was that Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you all for sharing part of your day with us. And I'm going to turn things back over to Calvin and Valentina.